we are here um, from all over the country. I see Philly in the house. Um, beautiful, beautiful. So we are all here in this moment sharing space and time together as we're discussing this idea of renewal and renewal after crisis or after a big thing has happened. And um, all of the potential and beauty and, and growth that could exist within this stage of crisis recovery work. Thank you for joining us. Next slide, please. So I would like to share before we dive into the jam, into the, the content of, the, um, of today's presentation, um, that we are um, partners of National Child Trauma, sorry, Traumatic Stress Network, um, and the School Crisis Recovery and Renewal. Here together, we're funded by SAMHSA, um, though our ideas are our own. And so we have to offer that disclaimer. Um, if um, our views and our opinions are our own. <clears throat> okay, next slide, please. My name is Oriana Ides, and I am a field coach with the School Crisis Recovery and Renewal Program project, um, rather, and I come to you with over 20 years of experience as a, a small school leader, teacher leader, um, a classroom teacher, a program director, and a school-based mental health therapist. I feel incredibly honored and humbled to be here in this space facilitating conversation and highlighting um, the learnings and best practices um, as it relates to healing through big crises, big things. So thank you for joining us. I'd like to uh, just share our agenda for this time together so you know where we're at, where we're going. Um, welcome and introduction, that's where we're at right now. We're going to spend a little bit of time recapping and previewing, catching folks up, um, bringing uh, to life into this moment the language that we've been using in past um, modules. So we're situated in the third module of a series of four, and so we'll be bringing in some of that language and those ideas. <clears throat> Also, and I'm so incredibly excited about this piece here, um, we are gonna be highlighting, elevating um, the voices and the experiences of some incredible school leaders um, in the field. Uh, they hold different capacities within the school, but have um, many years, um, 10 years plus each on their own, um, even more so experience uh, leading their students, families, and communities through crisis and renewal. So we have Coriander Milius, who's a SPED teacher, Oakland Tech High School here in Oakland, California. We have Dr. Savannah Shange, who's an assistant professor of anthropology and core faculty of critical race and ethnic studies at UC Santa Cruz. And we have Aaron Hughes, who's the wellness center coordinator at June, June Jordan School for Equity in San Francisco. Um, so after a robust and full conversation with them and with you, please also, um, we will uh, share some highlights of upcoming uh, learning opportunities and ways that you can support and engage with our work. Mm. So here we are in this moment together from all over the country um, in the middle of our days. And thank you so much for being here with us in the middle of your day. Um, we wanted to take a moment to ground in and settle uh, together in collective breath. And in um, just a few minutes, I would like to invite you to take some breaths with us and to practice a strategy um, or a technique rather called self-holding with us as we take a few intentional collective breaths. And so I would like to invite you to notice your feet. <clears throat> Are they on tippy toes? Are they grounded fully and firmly? What's that sensation like for you? I'd like you to notice where your hands are. And as you take a deep inhale, I'd like you to Pay notice to the sensation of your inhale in your nostrils. And as I exhale, 
Know that you're engaging your parasympathetic nervous system, which stabilizes and calms. And I invite you to take both hands and place them at your side cranial. And as you're holding, take a inhale. Again, heightening awareness, to the sensation of your skin touching your head. And the beautiful fact that you are holding yourself, you're holding your mind, where your ideas live and breathe and grow. I was, um, as we figure out Oriana's uh, audio, I just wanna say, I was feeling very held in that elongated moment. I kind of did one of those like ninth grader eye open to see when we were supposed to transition. Can you try again, Oriana? Oriana, I'm gonna step in as we figure it out. And maybe you can call in on your phone. Okay, this is what teamwork and partnership is like, right? <laughs> so um, I, I'm going to invite you. I know I just, that was the first time that I've done that holding practice. And I'm going to invite folks in the chat box as now that we're grounded and settled in to see and to offer um, what that felt like to hold your head up, to hold yourself, to be held. And I'm going to invite you to put in uh, the drop down from panelists and attendees so that um, we all can learn from one another. So I'll put my own uh, felt tense and um, good at the same time. So tense and good at the same time. Um, and you know, the reason that we start off our sessions at the School Crisis Recovery and Renewal Project is it, with grounding and settling in is because as, as our colleague Antoine, who's on the line said today, it's a lot of content that we offer you during these sessions. And, um, and we wanna really make sure, uh -huh, we wanna really make sure that all of us who are in big roles and doing big work that we have time to reconnect with ourselves. So I'm seeing it, I got chills and felt a release of stress, helped me focus. I was preoccupied with the sensation of my pulse in each of my palms. Ooh, that's really, really beautiful. And it felt calming. Um, so I'll just, I'll name for myself if we were in a room to share out that it felt for me like just a small way to actually feel the pressure, but also feel the structure to help me move my way. So thank you, Oriana, for grounding us. And I'm going to continue us moving forward now that we're feeling calm and a little released and help focus. So many of you have come to us throughout this session. So I'm going to go over this really briefly and quickly because, um, because we want to just get into the good stuff. But for those of you who are watching the recording or who are um, new to us, we want to again welcome you very, very, very strongly to and warmly to the School Crisis Recovery and Renewal Project. And uh, we are, as Oriana mentioned earlier, we're a project of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network in partnership with the Center for Applied Research Solutions. I work for CARS, Oriana and Livia, our tech support program manager. And we also get to partner with Trauma Transformed, a renowned movement builder, shaker organization of incredible folks who are really helping us think about systems systems and culture and climate trauma-informed and healing-centered work. So thank you, Antoine and Jen, and those of you who are on with us from T2. You can check out our website at schoolcrisishealing.org. And our work is really to create evidence-based and culturally responsive uh, trauma-informed and healing-centered practices in the aftermath after a big thing happens in a school community or is happening in a school community. We're really interested in educator and student-driven voice and choice and contribution in terms of how how does and, and what might we and how might we listen in to the educators and students in our school community to inform the way that we understand and respond, prevent, interrupt crises, either that we're experiencing or that we're actually creating and contributing to. So we are new, we're in our fifth month of five years with you and we're so grateful that so many of you have continued to show up and to be with us. Um, and again, I really want to welcome you and invite you to in the panelists and that in attendees to um, in the chat box to drop down and let us know who you are so you can build community with one another and we can continue to build community with you. I'm going to ask Olivia also to drop um, to drop 
the link not only to the leadership guide, so this is the guide that we released, some of you have contributed to um, back a couple months ago, that are voices of experience of state leaders like some of you and crisis responders like some of you and technical assistant providers, consultants like some of you around what does school crisis mental health leadership look like? Readiness in response, recovery and renewal. And we use a lot of that content to fuel our projects conversations, especially today when we're talking about the seven elements. Um, so thank you, Livia, for dropping that. And I'm also gonna invite you, uh, we have a worksheet today to help us um, to help us guide our learning. So if Livia, if you can also drop both the PowerPoint deck and the worksheet. Um, we really want to encourage you, just like we would encourage any learner, no matter what age, to help guide and track some of your thoughts. So big, rich, 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 um, big, 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 rich learnings that are coming from the guest speakers today. And I know for myself that I always need, I need somewhere to capture all the golden nuggets that come out of sessions like this. So we hope that the worksheet helps and leave you perfect. Thank you for putting that in the chat box. Um, Oriana, I'm going to invite to see if you can do one more sound check and we'll see if you're um, able to come back on. Okay, looks like you're still without sound. So hopefully Livia can help you. I'm going to continue to move us ahead. Um, so I am, again, if you were with us last week, you know that we're in module three, so we're in renewal. And this is the concept that we're really expanding as a whole national community. We're expanding our understanding of what school crisis is and can be and what all of the different phases of the work feel like. So we have, based on the National Child Traumatic Stress Network and many leaders and researchers, we have such good work around um, what might it look like to get ready before a big thing, or to respond to a big thing, or to recover to a big thing. What we are more interested in and playing with is the renewal. So what is the three years after, the five years after, the continued um, long-term, long-term, as someone said this morning in another call, the post, post, postvention, the long-term work after a big thing happens. And how might we use that conversation around uh, constructing a, a coherent story around what happened to us and with us and by us. How might we use that to then inform how we get ready and how we respond and how might we re-recover in order to really not only mitigate harm, but interrupt harm. So we're in this bucket. It's the most wobbly of buckets because it's the one that we as a country don't have a lot of um, concrete evidence around necessarily, but we do have a lot of funds of knowledge from many different cultures and peoples who have constantly been me making meaning, creating stories, telling stories, um, and reimagining what communities might feel like after they experience harm. And so our work together is to think about today specifically, what does that look like in the context of leadership? What is that context? And I'm looking at everyone who's on with us. So many of you are district and county and state leaders. So the question is, what does that look like um, for you as you are experiencing crisis and leading crisis, as you're experiencing crisis and trying to cultivate climates and cultures of connection, right? We talk, we talk about the renewal stage as the transition from chaos to cohesion. So uh, our, our task today is to always bring in the fundamental things that matter, no matter where we are in the crisis, that we're thinking about how we call the thing and why we call the thing. And I know that Aaron and Coriander and Savannah will talk a little bit about that. Like, do we even use the word trauma or crisis with young people or with the educators that we're working with? How do we approach crises from both an equity, equality, and intersectional lens and approach and understand that the way in which all of us heal is deeply individualized, but also deeply intersectional? How might we also think about our roles and our positions? So we're so grateful today that we've got folks who are in classrooms, in hallways, in wellness centers, uh, in larger bodies of work to help us. Well, I think we might have Oriana back. Yeah, we're going to check. Oriana, you just say hi when you're ready, when you're on. Um, hi. Um, hey, there we go. Mm -hmm. oh, great. Um, 
how do we how do we think about <laughs> how do we think about our different roles as we think about the leadership work and then of course the supporting the supporters um which all of you I think we just know so clearly now that we can't expect our young people to show up to school ready to heal or make meaning if we're not supporting our educators to do the same and our school leaders to do the same. Um, and the last of course is partners and partnerships. And we're so grateful that Aaron, especially as 14 years um, with uh, directing a wellness center knows how integral partners and partnerships are in the renewal work. Okay. So we're going to do a really quick rewind, a little like rewind back into what we talked about last week. If you were not with us last week, definitely feel free. All the recordings and the materials are up on our website. We're going to rewind and just do a little wait. What are we even talking about when we're talking about renewal? Okay. Um, Oriana, uh, you will cue me when you're ready to come back on when I see your video, but I'm going to keep going as your as your uh, co-facilitator until I see your video. So last week, Oriana asked as a part of our rumination or a part of our expansion around what uh, what renewal means. And these were some of the words and images that all of you came up with. You came up with a seedling starting to sprout, this concept of beginning again, stronger and better, restoration. And I just love this verb, deepening. And some of this might feel a little like wooey or touchy-feely for some of you, but we want to actually invite you that this is the hard, this is really rigorous work, um, that it is not, it is not necessarily um, intangible, but it's really rigorous work to help us think about how we reconnect with ourselves and the humanity of what it means to work and work with schools and for schools. And so oftentimes the, the work of crisis opens us to opportunities to really um, surface how we might be trauma organized cultures as trauma transformed has helped us help helped us conceptualize how might we be school communities that really thrive off of harm and thrive off of pain um, or expect crises or are potentially um, addicted to crisis as a way of connecting how might we move from that and into or with that and into a trauma-informed space where we're speaking shared language. We've got a foundational understanding of trauma and healing, which is what y'all are doing right now in this work. And then we understand the nature and the impact of not only just trauma, but also of healing. And then the last piece, and I really welcome Trauma Transformed who's on with us today to add in the chat box any other pieces or layers that um, would be helpful to us to understand their framework. This last piece is our invitation to move into being, being being healing organizations, healing school communities that are rooted in reflection and collaboration and relationship. And I just want you um, to note, many of you are familiar with the triune brain model, which is both helpful, sometimes a little bit limiting, but you'll note that if we think about this work, that you might think of the same three triune brains, this trauma organized brain, that it might be around safety, the brainstem, the assessing for safety and assessing for threat. You might think about the trauma-informed space as the limbic brain, the limbic system, right, of creating connection and, um, and really living in significant relationship with thrives when we're speaking this shared the same language. And then we might think of the healing organization as that neocortex, that ability to reflect and ability to wonder and ability to be imaginative. So um, it's a nice way to kind of think about the way that our body, our physiology is with the way we're understanding school cultures and communities. Okay. So taking a breath, I invite you to do the same. We move, we remember back in our conversation last week around what school crisis renewal is and what it could be. We think about school crisis renewal. Hey, awesome. <laughs> We think about school crisis renewal um, as a way, as a time that is not bound, but is thinking about where we are now and where we, meet, where we might be moving ahead. And it is ongoing, meaning that even if we may not address a big thing that happened 20 years ago, there is still room for it and still need for it now. And in fact, most of us, when we move into different positions or we move away from the site or the community where there was a lot of pain, some of us have more opening to do some um, reflection and some um, curiosity around how we can integrate what we went through into what we are going through and what we are leading in this moment. 
So the five concepts around school crisis renewal, and this is just our theory, we welcome you to add your own, but the kind of five ingredients that go into the stew around school crisis renewal is coping. Do I believe that I have the resources to adapt to what's in front of me in this moment? And how and who is helping me believe that? Who is validating my assessment, my appraisal of my resources? Resilience, not just bounce back as we remember from our conversation last week, but around creating structures that recognize all people's and every people's movement towards accessing their needs and getting their needs met, right? So it's not just adapting, but it's also the structures and the systems um, saying not only um, get help, but also we're providing help and we're acknowledging all of your different ways of seeking help. The third element is post-traumatic growth theory, PTG, um, out of 1996, this concept that uh, all of us, not only, it's not finding the silver lining, it's not finding the good thing that came out of something, but it's actually being able to live with something instead of living by something. Living in conversation with the big thing that happened to you rather than living and being all consumed by it. It's having a little bit more room to breathe in the big things that hold us. And the last two pieces are connected, of course, healing, which uh, Sean Jinright helps us and Prentice Hemphill and many other thought leaders help us understand that healing is, again, not only about just feeling good, it oftentimes doesn't feel good. Healing is an investigation and inquiry around the root causes of the harm that we may have experienced and a commitment to social action, social interruption, and potentially even social justice around creating the conditions to prevent and interrupt and mitigate the harm and the crisis and the pain that so many of us feel in school communities often and always. And the last is meaning making. This concept came coming from Niemeyer uh, and other theorists that help us understand that one of the biggest ways that we as humans create and, and grow is by putting back a story that was fractured because of a trauma or fractured because of pain, putting back a story together so that the story of self and the story of the collective feels whole and it's what we call a coherent narrative. What happened to me, why it happened to me, and what am I gonna do with that story? How, do, how does that incorporate into my worldview of myself, into my worldview and my understanding of the people around me? So I'm gonna pause and I'm gonna invite you in the chat box uh, to just name, especially if you were, oh, beautiful, see Jen already had this going, <laughs> to, uh, to put in the chat box, one thing that's coming up for you thus far, when we're thinking about the concept of renewal, that could be something that you were sitting and wondering with from last week, that you've heard me say thus far, that's kind of tickling you, um, a maybe a idea around renewal that is challenging, and while you're putting those in the chat box, I'm going to offer, um, I'm going to offer what Jen is putting up, which is that yes, up against enough stress or trauma, our schools and organizations begin to present with same symptoms of traumatic stress as individuals, hyper arousal, reactive, fractured, us versus them, and the knowledge change is important to trauma-informed, but the healing comes from how we embody in ourself. I'm literally pressing on my body right now, how we embody and how we embed what we do. So healing-centered interventions and policies. All of this is not and never is linear. Thank you, Jen, beautiful. Uh, so we've got another, another, um, another inquiry point around the change of school administrators, which can be I think what we're getting to, Wendy, your suggestion is like, how does that experience, how does that contribute to our experience of stressors and constant change? And actually how might that might open us into new ways of understanding and experience sometimes with fresh eyes or fresh leadership. And, uh -huh, right. So if we have school leaders that change frequently or are being changed frequently, there's a lack of institutional memory. Um, I might speak a little bit about that later. Wendy, you're making me think of, uh, a principal coaching session that I had a couple months ago. And then we have another, another contribution that's the idea of knowing when it's time to focus on renewal after crisis. Uh -huh. So one of the ways that when we've talked about this work so far in our modules, when we've asked you, how do you know when you're ready to, when your body is telling you that you're moving from response to recovery to renewal, 
But one of the ways that we might know is when there is space to reflect, <laughs> when, there is, um, when there is openness to reflect. So if you're sitting with someone in a coaching relationship or in a meeting and you're asking them to, why might, why might have you done this? Or why might have that have happened? And the response is, I don't know. It's not because they don't know. Their nervous system collectively or individually just may not be ready yet for the reflection. There may not be space for that. Yeah. And so a couple more things and I'm gonna toss it. We're gonna talk about these seven elements of leadership and move into the, the good juicy golden nuggets of today. Um, Jen is offering us how we persist and resist. How do we center our humanity, even as systems are oriented to dehumanizing practices? And what happens when unhealed institutional memory paralyzes people in the school? Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are beautiful. I hope Aaron and Savannah and Coriana, you're kind of taking in these questions. These are really important questions. What happens when unhealed institutional memory paralyzes people in the school? And how do we include all voices and experience in meaning making? Who gets to tell the story? Kate, we are so appreciative of you always lifting up equity and intersectionality and in all of your contributions. Thank you. Okay, these are good questions for our, our folks coming on. So very quickly, I'm going to just offer you that we're going to transition right now into talking about today's focus, which is how does this look like as a leader, which is the exact essential questions that you're offering in the chat box. So if I am a leader, how am I supported and validated in living in my vulnerability? <laughs> how am I supported and, uh, and coached? And how might I have the knowledge and skills and attributions that allow me or train me or give me the muscle memory to sit in more opening than in closing? So crises often expose either the foundations of what was healthy or the foundations of what was deeply toxic. We're experiencing that now as a collective. So how might me, how might I in my leadership training, and I'm speaking for myself as someone who has her teaching credential, doctorate of education, not ever, not once was any of this conversation ever brought up in my training, but it sure was necessary every single moment of the work that I've done in my experience in education. So how might we actually center this work so that we prepare and support our leaders to then prepare and support them to lead. Okay, last but not least. So I'm gonna to toss it over to Oriana and team in a little bit. The piece that I wanted to offer is that these seven elements of renewal leadership come out of, as, as I was mentioning earlier, they come out of this, um, this guide that actually came from you all. So we put out an inquiry many months ago to the field to state leaders, just like yourself, district, county leaders, and asked, what, ha what does healing look like? <laughs> what does meaning making look like as a leader? And these were the themes that came from their input. So today we're gonna hear from Coriander, Aaron, Oriana, Savannah around the seven elements, creating structural witnessing. So how do you literally create programmatic, the infrastructure where people in schools see one another, literally validate one another in their own experience of harm or healing. How might we as leaders center significant relationships as a fundamental practice of school crisis renewal? How might we foster healing centered cultures just as Jen was lifting up in this idea of non-linear dynamic and inquiry based work? How might we encourage individual and collective storytelling about the crisis which speaks to Kate's question, who gets to tell the story? What does it feel like to create experiences for students to tell their own story and partner with young people uh, and then live in multiple stories? What does it feel like to be prepared and to sit in the sticky stuff where there are more questions than answers, which again, many of us receive training, especially in the crisis world to have the answer because that's when people are feeling big and big and vulnerable and open. That's what feels the most vulnerable is to not have the answer. And, uh, this team we were all gathering to prepare for today, and we know that that is, for many of you who are administrators, that is a huge challenge going on right now um, in COVID response, is being told one answer, needing an answer, ask people demanding response, and that compression from yourself as a leader um, might contribute to a lot of stress and a lot of harm and fracture. So we want to talk about what does that feel like to sit with the sticky stuff. A very academic term. And then the last two, 
that doing this work, this conversation itself is the renewal work. <laughs> That it's a very, it's kind of the meta, right? That sometimes investigating in what healing means to us is healing. And then the last but not least is that we want to engage in collective reflection to fuel and inform our crisis readiness. So if we are leading statewide crisis readiness plans, how might we actually take the collective storytelling to inform the way that we uh, mandate policy and emergency operations or that we cultivate the connection between partners in response and recovery. So those are the seven. I'm going to invite, I'm going to, um, we're going to cross our fingers and see if Oriana can unmute. And I'm going to invite Savannah and Erin and Coriander to come on and Oriana will introduce her colleagues. This actually is my favorite part of the hour and a half we are here together. And it is the space in which we are able to elevate, amplify, shine beautiful, glittery light on the powerful work that is being done in the field. And um, what I think is incredibly important in our process of learning, the reflection. And so we have with us three different powerful voices that we're going to invite into the conversation. Coriander Milius. Aaron Hughes and Dr. Savannah Shange. I myself will also be sharing my experience and reflection from my years working in schools. And so I actually am going to share a little of the, the insight and the reflection that I've been engaged in regarding the first element, which is creating structural witnessing. Because of the fast pace of schooling and schools, um, we often are wearing so many different hats and the nature of our work can also be incredibly isolating by default, not by intention, but by default. So this piece right here, this first element is incredibly important to be intentional around and uh, to think about as school leaders, how we create space in our school day, in our caregiver programming, and in our professional development for students, families, community members, and staff to feel witnessed, to see, to feel seen and heard, which we know is uh, incredibly healing and a deep desire that we all hold and carry. And so just a, a few, uh, I've been a part of centering the experience of being witnessed has been really integral to our, actually many of them, really try to hold advisory as a space in which students have the opportunity to get to know their, their teachers or a staff member in which in times of renewal, we can really lean on to ensure safety, witnessing, um, and the sense of being uh, seen and heard. And in addition, I'd like to, in, uh, additionally, I'd like to also explore um, the way we use professional development spaces and staff meetings and the way we gather with staff. You know, often I've been a part of staff communities that sit in rows all facing um, the back of each other's heads, looking up at, you know, um, the whiteboard, which is very much like banking models of education where we're not given the space or time to see one another's face or to experience the humanity or just to see the weight that we're holding after a long day. And I think um, meeting in circle, creating space for check-ins that really allow people to center their humanity and to bring their um, full self um, safely into a, a learning community is important for adults as well. And the other piece that I want to highlight as a way to create structural witnessing is through curriculum. Curriculum, especially in humanities classes at all grades, can be a really important way to create space for students and families to feel seen and heard as they wade through the heaviness of crisis. Um, and outside of crisis as well. So thinking about the, the projects that we engage in, the circles that we hold in our classrooms, also the texts that we choose to use, all can really support ways in which our, our young people and our families and the communities they exist within 
are. That's what I'd like to contribute to element one. And I'd like to move on to element two, um, which is centering significant relationships. And I want to invite Coriander Milius into the conversation here to share her insight, um, wisdom, and learning, because uh, relationships are such critical components to our work as holding school spaces. Coriander. Hi, Ori. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, yeah, the word relationships, right? We first think of people, like our relationships with people. But then I was also thinking about our relationships with concepts um, and ideas because I'm a special education teacher. And my students are um, living in crises. Uh, some of my students are living in crises all the time simply because of their non-neurotypical uh, brains and how they relate to the world and how they relate to sensory input and how they relate to ha being different and being treated, um, especially in middle school, you know, horribly by peers and by adults alike. And so our relationship with what we consider normal what we consider smart, what we consider uh, safe, you know? And uh, we, need to, we need to think about individually what our relationships are with those concepts and are we including? Are we including the non-neurodiverse community? Are we, are we going out there to learn their experience so that we are including them? Um, and, and that means that your relationship with yourself needs to be centered at all times. I'm a non-Black woman who speaks English, is college educated. Uh, I have to be in relationship with knowing who I am in the community that I am part of. Do you consider yourself part of that community or do you consider yourself as other? Your relationship with that community, you need to center how you think about that and how you reflect on that and how you are constantly working towards being part of that community. Because, there, so I work at Oakland Technical High School, very large high school, can't develop a meaningful relationship, don't wanna develop a, a meaningful relationship with everyone. But my the way that I go into work is all relationships are potentially meaningful until they prove otherwise to me. Um, because when a crisis happens, whether it's individually or school-wide, you, you don't know who you're gonna need in that moment. You know, Jason, who is the custodian on my campus, we chop it up about the A's games. We're chopping it up about stock markets. And guess what? He's also so-and-so's cousin's uncle's um, brother. And if so-and-so is having a crisis, I know I can go talk to Jason, but I only know that because I developed a relationship with him of trust and that's ongoing. And when you are looking at being healing centered, you should always be developing relationships with everybody. There's no hierarchy. I need to make sure that I'm, I know this person and this person, know everybody, because you don't know who everybody knows and everybody has something to offer. So um, the recently at Tech, we've started doing mindfulness for staff because some of our teachers practice it and, and, and do it outside of being teach, teachers at school and came to the admin and said, hey, we wanna offer this to staff. And that's, this is, we're in our second year of that. And we're only able to do that because people get to know each other, build relationships and feel safe enough to say, okay, today at four, instead of grading papers, I'm gonna go sit in a mindfulness Zoom with Eriko and Barbara and Janet and, and maybe some teachers who never came before. Um, and so you have to have an administration who is open to that, who creates the type of environment at that site that fosters relationship building and trust. Because through relationship building, you build trust. And when you have trust with, your, with who you work with, you can create goals centered around healing at your school site and those goals that you'll revisit and reflect on later to make sure you're moving forward with that. Um, that's all through relationship building. And, and then uh, as a special ed teacher, I build relationships and every teacher should, everyone who works 
with youth should, especially if you're not from that community, you need to be building relationships with the community. Um, look for the bridges that already exist. Be like, can I walk on this bridge and get to know this, this support system? Or if you see that there's a need to build a bridge, let me build this bridge. Because in a crisis, you're going to need the community and you must be part of the community. And the only way to do that is to build relationships, right? So relationships are like the most important thing and um, especially the one with yourself and, and who you are and who you are in the community that you work in because you bring that with you. There's been uh, many times and there probably will be more times we have some OG teachers at Tech, even the new teachers though too, teachers who, um, okay, <laughs> I can see <laughs> teachers who, uh, don't have a good relationship with themselves and it bleeds out onto the students and the students feel it. Or anyone who works with, not just teachers, but anyone who's working with a student, if you don't have that dope relationship with yourself, if you're not healing yourself, they, they feel it and they're not, and it doesn't have as much meaning. So I see that my time is up. Thank you, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Coriander. There, I mean, there were so many uh, gems in there that you shared, and I really love the way that you frame um, relationship not as just being like, what can someone do for you down the line, but everyone has something to offer in, in moments of calm and in moments of healing. And really, through conversation and intentional relationship, we discover what that is, and that's our humanity. And that's, that's so beautiful and incredible, incredibly important. <clears throat> And so the third element is fostering a healing centered culture. Um, and I'm gonna share a little bit about this one. This one is so deeply intertwined for me with um, number one, which is creating structural witnessing. Um, I'm having um, so many of my, my ideas and my experiences um, are interconnected for both, I think, just as in the first one, it's incredibly important to create uh, classrooms that are humanizing, um, where there is space for students to safely bring their full and whole selves into the classroom. And that value is placed um, not on production, but on process and on the process of learning. Um, and we do that through curriculum, through the way we deliver curriculum, and through the types of curriculum that we bring to our students, ensuring that it's culturally relevant and pers pers um, purposeful. <clears throat> I think that's incredibly important when um, fostering healing centered cultures within a school. Um, I was a part of a school where the entire uh, school grades ninth through 12th learned about um, oppression. And, uh, and importantly, most importantly, not most importantly, but um, internalized oppression and that we all created spaces within advisory, within town hall meetings, within professional development, um, as adults and within the classrooms to explore through curriculum, through game, through conversation, um, what internalized oppression looked like, what it felt like, what it sounded like. Um, and having this common language and experience as a community was incredibly powerful and healing um, and brought us closer to our humanity within a, a very you know, traditionally sterile place. I think also incredibly important when fostering a healing centered culture is the ability to apologize and building um, that into uh, professional development that, that adults need to learn how to take ownership for error and adults need to learn how to recognize ways in which we may misstep because we're bound to do it. It's a human trait. And so, um, learning when you need to apologize is incredibly important in how you do that with young people that are experiencing a complex trauma and a myriad of crisis 
possibly within school and just in the nature of existing in this world. Um, how we apologize is incredibly important. And so I've been a part of school communities where we've practiced that and we've pulled it apart and we've explored as staff what our own experience with being apologized to um, felt like. And that is incredibly important in fostering healing. Um, additionally is minimizing the stigma of therapy and how do we create a culture and not just therapy but a connection with resources and services and supports and how do we create a culture where we normalize that and where we welcome it and where we accept it as part of being a collective that leans on um, resources and one another and so um, those were ways in which I've been a part of really powerful communities that centered um, culture. Culture is created no matter what, right? It can be an unhealthy um, dynamic or uh, levels of unhealthy dynamic, or it can be incredibly intentional. And so I think it is um, often that we forget to focus on school culture. And often is it that our focus on school culture is about behavior and about how to foster compliance rather than um, humanity and celebration and communal community strength. And so I think that definitely needs to be the focus of um, building a healing centered culture. I'd like to invite um, Dr. Savannah Shange on for our discussion around element four. And so a welcome to the scene, Dr. Shange. Uh, element four is encouraging individual and collective storytelling about the crisis. And you have had incredible experience with this as a classroom teacher and as a school uh, teacher leader and as a, um, researcher coming into a community that you are also a part of. And so I'm wondering if you um, would be willing to share your experience, your wisdom and your, your reflection around the importance of um, element four. Yes, and thank you so much. Oh, I'm sorry, I have some background on one second. Sorry about that. Um, okay. I just wanted to say, um, I really, first of all, thank you so much um, to you, Oriana and Liotta for bringing us here and having this conversation. And in particular, Oriana, I think there's so many um, really important, I don't wanna say gems, cause I don't wanna dig in the earth and strip it of resources. I'm more giving, thinking of like sparkling lights. You're giving us some really important sparkling lights, just lifting up what you just said about how do we not value compliance over humanity? Um, this piece about apologizing, but really I think what's most connected to storytelling is something you said at the beginning around how to create space in schools for heart space, right? Where we're not just connecting academically with young people. And for me, that's really important when we imagine storytelling. And so um, there's this idea of, okay, we're thinking about this individual stories and this collective stories and how important it is to be able to make meaning through narratives. And I think particularly for those of us gathered in this Zoom room, there are individual stories, there's collective stories, and there's also institutional stories. And so for the people who are here in the chat, have you had to write up a, you know, whether it's in a grant application or in a district report, have you had to kind of tell the story of a school site and put it in a little bow for someone else to read and like check off somewhere? Like, are you familiar with that? I know Erin, <laughs> I know Erin and Coriander are, right? And so whether we're thinking individually, collectively or institutionally, I think the important piece of the story, there's two, it's like a two-handed piece. You have to own your story. You can only be able to tell your own story, right? And you have to remember that your story is not the story. And that's true for every single person that has experienced crisis. And as um, Coriander has said, for many of us, experience is the crisis, right? So your idea of where the crisis begins may not be the same as someone else's, right? Um, and so I think for me as an anthropologist in particular, I'm really aware of how our collective narratives get built because each of our individual stories, whatever position you're in, you know, I think, J you know, Jason, the custodian, the fourth kid that's worked with his parent, the teacher, all of those stories are equally important, but they can only be 
um, sometimes, particularly in these public facing pieces, one collective narrative. So the more awareness we can build, um, uh, that we can build around how that collective narrative is built, the more that collective narrative can actually serve the process of renewal as opposed to hampering it. So whose story gets privileged in the telling of a crisis? And so for, for instance, if you're having a healing centered um, approach, you might center the experiences of survivors, right? But then depending on how you understand an incident, there may be survivors who you don't recognize as such, right? Whose experiences get kind of summarized, right? Added in, put with some commas and some parentheses and whose get lifted up. And can you help serve the process of renewal and healing by thinking strategically about what story needs to be lifted up, right? It may not be the most common, right? You may only have, for instance, here in Oakland, California, we have a lot of um, students who speak Spanish at home, a lot of students who speak English, and a lot of people who speak Black English. And we also have a lot of students who speak indigenous languages from Central America in particular, right? Um, so there's a lot of there's mom speakers, right? You may specifically in your school setting, even if like, oh, okay, most of our students speak English or Spanish at home, you may specifically say, you know what, I'm gonna lift up the story of a student whose family speaks Hmong or mom at home in order to give that whole community a sense of being centered, even if they are proportionally smaller, right? And that's true too for students who may have special needs and may have other kind of orientations towards the community. The other thing I wanna say about storytelling is a question I have about crisis is, does your story begin and end in the school building? Because if it does, I can guarantee you that's not the story, right? That's a chapter. You've plucked a chapter from the middle of a story. Because I tell you right now, if the story begins and ends in the school building, it's incomplete, right? Just like we know that the roots of crisis are deeper than a classroom, right? When you're encountering a student who's struggling with a concept, or you're encountering encountering two students who are you know having a difficult time being able to be in presence with each other. You can't put that all on you because it didn't start when AT Bio started, right? Um, just like you know those roots go deeper, the story of crisis also starts way before the beginning of the school, school day. So right now, yes, it starts in December with COVID-19. It starts in 2008 with the great financial crisis, sure. But it also starts with Jim Crow, with the Vietnam War, right? With ongoing settler colonialism in the United States. Maybe this story starts with the annexation of Puerto Rico in 1898. Maybe it starts with slavery and settlement. And that might seem like a really long time ago, but when we talk about collective storytelling, if you talk to the parents of your students that you're working with, right? If you talk to your own parents, if their stories of this crisis go that far back, then it's important that yours does as well, right? And it's not just to kind of include people or be more PC, but because the story of renewal also goes that far back. Right? So as we reach back for the, for the roots of crisis, that can also be a time where we can reach back for the roots of renewal, right? Because we have been, um, we have been healing and surviving for so long. People are bringing up some really important pieces around land acknowledgement. I think land acknowledgement is a really great example, right? Of thinking about, so right now I'm calling from, you know, I'm calling in from um, Oakland, California, which is currently, um, which is Chichenyo Ohlone land, right? Which is also, which is not owned by Chichenyo Ohlone descendants, but also, you know, been passed through by Como, Miwok, other communities. However, often when we think about land acknowledgements, we think about whose land was this, who was here, it's only a turning back. Can we have a land acknowledgement that's paired with a community acknowledgement that acknowledges where the current um, connections that your school site has with ongoing Native American organizing right now in your community? Where are the Native vendors that you work with, whether it is to supply materials to your school community, to supply consultation? What is your pipeline for hiring Native American educators, right? How are you reaching out to Native students in your community to make sure they're served in your community, right? So pairing the past with the present is so important. And I'm glad that you brought that in, Sierra. Um, so the length of the story, sorry. So I think that the, the two pieces that I wanted to kind of end here with were um, encouraging us to tell a longer story, right? So tell a longer story from wherever we are. And then also that just as much as we're storytelling, we're also story listening, right? Because um, there's always gonna be a prism. So if we experience ourselves and really create places, create ways for students, for teachers, for those on our teams to do more listening than telling, then everyone will get a chance to feel centered in that collective narrative.
Oh my gosh, Savannah, I am like, um, I was on mute, but I'm like snapping and clapping and jumping in my seat at all these really important points that you're raising. And Shoot, Oriana, this is, I Thank forgot, you. I said, I forgot my last bullet point. I can see my last piece. Come on, bring it, bring it. We okay, okay, because it, it, it goes into the sticky part. The sticky is next, right? Yes. So this goes back to the piece that you were saying about heart space and advisory, right? And finding mm -hmm. ways to engage with students, not just academically. I just want to say the caveat with telling more listening than telling is often I find that the stories that get dropped out are the stories of students who either no longer attend the school, right? Mm -hmm. Who have been pushed out, students who are not academically successful, students who cut class, right? You tell the story of the people who are in the building right now at this moment at 9.05, and you may need to do some extra work to find and listen to the stories of students who are not always present, right? Or may not be succeeding in the same way. But I really feel like those kinds of spaces that you brought up are the places where we're able to include students, not just as students, but as people, right? As community members. And if we don't, um, if we don't do that kind of um, uh, cultivation that you're talking about, we won't have the opportunities to listen to stories outside of the boxes of teaching and learning. Yes, absolutely. And there's so many reasons why those stories are not either welcomed or we um, don't have the capacity or energy or focus to bring those stories into the space. But there's such richness in, in understanding deeper um, th those stories that are often excluded or, or that are not uh, sitting in our classroom at 9.05, as you said. So thank you so much for that, Savannah. Um, our next element is... Um, sitting in the stickiness and how do we prepare to sit in the stickiness and um Erin Hughes is gonna share her experience with us around the this phenomenon this reality that we often have more questions than we do answers and how do we hold that um as leaders and so um Erin I want to welcome you into the space Thank for some you. I'm really uh, yeah. um Grateful to be here um, and to listen to everything that's been shared so far. Um, I really wanted to focus on this aspect um, because this for me is what is present every day, right? And I'm a social worker. I'm the coordinator of a wellness center in a public high school, a small school by design with a social justice focus and mission. And I've been there for 14 years trying to do healing work. And what I know from all of that is it's the muck. It's the stickiness that is the work, right? Those, I, I saw a meme the other day where there was like the picture of what we imagine healing looks like. And it's that like pristine moment on the top of the hill where we're peaceful and in quiet. And it's beautiful when we can access those moments, but usually what it looks like is when we're like in the thick of it, when we're crying and look a mess and you know are undone, that's where a lot of our healing is really birthed. And so I think that it's really challenging for school systems to participate in the work of healing and renewal because we have a challenge around really being in the stickiness of it, right? Um, the other thing that I think is really important when I was thinking about this um, is this idea of what renewal can often mean, that it often means I saw somebody use the word restore when you guys were talking about like, words that came up or resuming something, right? That idea of like, after a crisis, we wanna get back to how it was. And part of the issue is schools are not designed to be places of healing. That's not in the design and structure of most schools. And so often if we're really doing this work and really asking these questions, we're having to acknowledge that we're not going back to the way it was before, because probably most likely the way it was before wasn't a safe space or a healing space for most people in the school, including the staff and the students and the families, right? And so that can be really difficult and uncomfortable conversations if you're really looking at that work is to recognize, wait, our whole foundation might not be in the place that we need it to. And then what do we do with that information and awareness, right? Um, I think the other thing that's really challenging and is part of like the muck and the stickiness is that healing isn't linear, right? It's not this nice like, you know, process of you get to go through the different stages you guys have talked about and then you just get to be in this place of renewal, right? Things are constantly happening. Experiences are continuing, you know, to, to happen in this space. And so um, dealing with that 
is, is a challenging thing to manage, I think, in a school environment. Um, I also think that there's unique aspects to a school environment that make renewal challenging, right? We know that who's in our buildings, who's in our community at any given time is always shifting. So students have left, new students have come, same with you know, teachers or leadership, right? And so how do you work if we're acknowledging that renewal is often happening way down the line, right? Maybe like a year or more after an event has occurred, how are you managing the needs of a constantly shifting and changing community? And how do you still need to speak to the people that are still there, who are still carrying that experience in their bodies? And how do you speak to the needs of the people who are coming into that space? And how does that story that exists of what happened impact those people and what are their needs, right? And so I think there's so much, um, I think tension, right, that always exists in how do we create a space that um, is capable of being a healing centered and renewing kind of community. Um, and I think the other piece that I wanted to say when it comes to leadership, right, is that to me, the way that we can lead in a process of renewal is being really grounded and centered in the fact that it is mucky that it is sticky and it, being able to name that for folks from the beginning, to be able to normalize that, that if we're feeling tension and discomfort in the work, it doesn't mean that there's like a problem always that needs to be fixed. It's an, it's an indicator of something that we need to go into, but it can also be evidence of like we're in the work, right? And so if as a leader, you're naming that and normalizing that and holding space for that, right? that can help the community be able to move through that without freaking out and feeling like, you know, we're gonna be completely disheveled. I think about like as a mother, when my child is having a meltdown, you know, the way that we renew is I get grounded. If I'm able to be grounded and hold space for them, for all of their feelings, for whatever they need to do with their body, with whatever's coming up, then they can, um, reintegrate themselves and their nervous system and come back into place, restoring off of what I'm being able to provide. And so I think that that's really important in leadership is how do you hold that space and not get knocked all over the place um, by what's happening with people and um, have that be an expectation while also providing some containment, right? We don't want it so open and chaotic in the muck of it that it feels really stressful and like triggering, right? We wanna still be able to provide safety. So creating that space and then also having that containment that makes it manageable for folks, I think is really important. Um, but I just, you know, I'm 14 years in, still trying to stay in this mud, <laughs> finding, you know, ways to um, move forward. And I uh, send love and appreciation to all of you who I'm sure are in the same place. So thanks for listening. Thank you, and thank you so much for sharing that. Um, just like you all are sharing so many important um, points that I'm really excited to uh, bring us all together in a few moments for a uh, dialogue back and forth and that we can kind of elevate and build upon the things that we're sharing um, through these elements. But our orientation to stickiness is critical, right? And, and really normalizing that conflict and tension are important parts of, of life and our existence and um, that our role is not to uh, necessarily solve it or absolve the situation of it, but how do we create a container for it and um, build awareness around it. So thank you so much for that one. Um, our next element is uh, the sixth in these um, set of seven, and that is a renewal itself can foster a renewed commitment to the work. And this one is uh, incredibly true for me. Um, I believe this 100% that uh, in any challenge and any um, thing that we must um, persevere through that there is incredible learning and momentum to be gained and gathered along the way. And so um, I'm just gonna speak a little bit to this one. And <clears throat> I think that the likelihood of um, renewal, really fostering and um, re 
committing um, the community members to the work is dependent on the culture of the school and a lot of the readiness work and things that are in place prior to um, a crisis or what you're able to do between the crisis and renewal phase in that year or so um, afterwards. That this is um, about providing emotionally corrective experiences to the people engaged in um, the community and in this work. And when we have an emotionally corrective experience, when we're able to learn new orientations to um, conflict or to uh, healing or to all of the many emotions um, that get activated within us as we've experienced um, a harmful thing or a crisis, we um, are stronger after. We are more equipped, more resourced, and more ready to be in relation and to be into in, in you know real liberatory work. And so this element six is so incredibly true and important and inspiring to me that it, it reminds me of um, companion gardening. And, you know, when we <clears throat> thinking about the quality of relationships and the way we're able to tend to relationships. And when we grow a tomato with basil together, that they're creating protective um, elements that really allow each one as individuals to grow um, in a more strong and sturdy and vibrant way. And I, I see this happening when we uh, pay special attention um, and intention to the culture of a school and <clears throat> to relationships. It's really being um, inspiring and motivating and building a momentum. Um, and so much of this is like, I wanna bring back in the piece around naming when we have a common language and when we have done the work to really unpack what words and things and experiences mean to us and we can come together collaboratively around uh, naming the things that are real in our lives, in our school day and you know beyond, then, then we are a stronger community and we feel uh, the momentum and commitment um, we really form as comrades and as um, committed to each other. And, and those are the most beautiful working uh, communities I've been a part of is when I feel deep commitment to Savannah and Coriander and Erin and I work um, in incredible ways when I feel a commitment to the people I'm working alongside and, and that's through incredible healing work intentionally. And so our next element and then we'll have some time to be in conversation is engaging in collective reflection to fuel and inform crisis readiness. And I'm gonna ask Coriander to join us again for some reflection on this seventh element. Hey, okay, we got three minutes for this. So um, I, I just wanna, as a, as a special education teacher, we are constantly reflecting on goals that we've created as a team for each student, the individual education um, plan. And I think that, that that system works well when you have those relationships with trust and you can create these um, goals and reflect on them and see, have you made progress in them? And do we need to tweak it and make it different? Or do we need to rewrite it? Like I'm a fan of systems of accountability when we're talking about reflection. And um, having all the voices at the table is crucial. Like you have to, you have to talk to the mod severe students and their families. How has school been for you? How has the school bus, how has getting to and from school been? How has the, how have you been treated at school? And a lot of times these voices are completely left out. And um, so we have to make sure that we're advocating for the voices and, and specifically the voices who are the most impacted by whatever the crisis is that you're dealing with. Are they at, is that voice, are those voices at the table or is it just a bunch of admin you know, who, aren't, who aren't impacted by it at all? Um, so really making sure that there's a system to collect the data, to get the voices, to create the space for the sharing um, in, in both school and community, but keeping a record of that reflection because it needs to be 
you need to be looking at it. You need to be constantly looking at it. And like Aaron was saying with the shifting, um, how school shifts, I'm like you have some OGs who've been there for 20 years and then you have the new teachers. So it's, it's good to have a point of reference for the newer folks to come in to see, oh, this, this happened. These, you know, two kids were shot and killed three years ago when you taught here. Wow, like that's like, that, that's impacting you. And I work with you. Um, so anyway, I don't know, ladies, is there something else you want to say about um, collective reflection while we have no minutes left? Well, yeah, let's all come in and just see um, very briefly um, what we are sitting with. And so if it's in relation to slide seven, please feel free to uh, chime in. But um, after hearing all of the seven elements and chorus, what what are we sitting with? Maybe just a word or two. And definitely want to elevate uh, voices in the chat as well. So um, yeah, this is our entire community's co question is not just posed to Coriander, Aaron and Savannah, um, Leora as well, definitely. And for um, everyone in the chat, where are we sitting with? Where, where are you feeling affirmed in, in the, what you're seeing, what you're feeling, the work that you're doing? What, what are you wondering? Um, what do you feel curious about? I guess part of what I'm thinking about is the importance for leadership to really look at these models and see the necessity for um, leading communities through these different stages. You know, I think oftentimes schools don't get to have an experience of renewal because we're never really like putting our focus and intention there. We stay so busy with all the work, with the complex trauma of everything that's happening. And how can we, through the storytelling, through the reflection, through all these different pieces that were shared, how can we create an experience for the community where there can be an experience of renewal? that becomes then a part of that story and becomes part of that meaning making and becomes a part of the skill um, that everybody from that experience is able to bring into their lives and as they move forward. Um, so I just think that we have to make intentional choices to sometimes pause some of the things we're doing to be mm -hmm. able to center this work. And I think that's what's really challenging and where I come back to our systems aren't designed for this, right? Because we always have to do something special or change the schedule to kind of have like a healing event or focus mm -hmm. often in schools. And so like, how can we, um, and especially for leaders, hold that vision of understanding this work is necessary and make decisions that are aligned with it being possible. Um, mm -hmm. I think it takes a lot of like effort and um, commitment to do that in the midst of everything else that goes on in a school. Yeah, Erin, for me, I'm really um, gonna walk away mm -hmm. with this question around what, what happens, what is all the, the possi possibility that exists when we create schools that are from a healing so that that is the intention um, and then we build from there from that heart center as opposed to trying to squeeze uh, healing into the right left hand corner right yeah and I'm also I'm wondering how um, I mean I'm just still remember when we did the the holding at the beginning Mm -hmm. I know you weren't supposed to be holding for as long as we did but I really was also super zoned out with the head holding and I'm wondering if there's ways for everyone, including school leaders, to be able to bring that kind of sensation that we started with into this renewal process. So it mm -hmm. is listening and doing all these seven pieces, but it's not just externalized to helping everyone else renew. And then the person who's holding the process is emptied out. Yes. Right? Like how can we be included in that renewal and use the tools we have right here and that we're like kind of sharing right now to support us through that. Beautiful, thank you. I was gonna say that um, sometimes we can't wait for our admin to get it together. Sometimes we have to, as the um, other members of the school community, 
really put the pressure on them. Maybe they don't even see it. And a lot of times that's what it is. So you have to be on the faculty council. You have to go to those meetings and you have to organize and put the pressure on the leadership to the point where they're like, this is what our school community wants. And, and we need to bring this to the school community because you will wait. If you're gonna wait for your school leaders, you might be waiting for a long time. Thank you. Um, Leora, can we welcome you back into the conversation? I am, I'm here, thank you. I wanna do a really big thank you to Aaron and Savannah and Coriander. And um, I'm hoping that everyone on the line is giving snaps and hand waves and applause. And uh, you know, we were talking yesterday and it's this is in itself is us sitting in the muck, right? It's it's being exposed and vulnerable with the fact that we as panelists and as holders of this work may not have all the answers, but that we're willing to be in the muck together. And so I just really want to thank you and Oriana and all of the folks who were willing to expose their vulnerability together and be in learning in public, as Adrian Marie Brown says. And welcome you to go off video and mute yourself as we close. Um, so I, I'm really holding what Kate put in the chat box around how do we apply this work knowing that so many of us are in response mode into COVID. And so I will, I, I really think that it's an opportunity for us to think about how we have all renewed and have coped from previous crises and how we can learn from that experience in this current one. And all of us have had, when we've lost students, we've had to transition into life without that student in the empty chair, empty seat in the classroom. When we've lost colleagues, we've had to re-merge re and reorient. When we've experienced natural disasters. And so how might we learn from the ways in which we've moved through the hard in the past to then prepare for moving through and hard in the now and in the future. Thank you again for all of you. I, I wanna appreciate what Jen is putting in as we move into close. I wanna appreciate that Jen is putting in that it's really hard to sit in it in order to heal. And I myself am a hyper, hyper human when it comes to crisis. I get a lot of sense of purpose by being in service. And so part of my work, and we talk about this on our team a lot, is how do we know that we our nervous systems might go hyper or hyper hypo or hyper when we're in need to be seen and need to be feeling like we're in control when something is feeling overwhelming and the other invitation that jen's comment in the chat box is making us remember or inviting us to remember as we think about the general leadership skills is that oftentimes we keep busy so we don't have to sit with it and actually that itself is a thought for us to think about as we lead this work that many of us, I know there are a lot of school communities that are inviting folks into med meditation and mindfulness practice, but without many other supports and cultures around opportunities to heal and structural witnessing and connecting, actually inviting whole communities without structure to sit can be deeply, deeply unearthing. <laughs> So part of our work is to think about how do we do the both and how do we invite ourselves to sit in with it so that when we're inviting others to sit with it and when stuff comes up, just as Aaron said, we can actually contain what comes out and think about and move with it to in that cycle of inquiry, um, transform and transmutate our experiences as school communities. So I just wanted to offer um, I wanted to offer that we, in the slide deck, you'll get these general skills. These are the kind of the, the general takeaways um, from today. If you're feeling like a lot was coming out, this is a way for you to feel a little bit more concrete, the kind of like, por lo menos, like at minimum, as we move through, what might we think about? And I do want to offer you that next week, um, our team always offers coaching clinics a week after big conversations like this so that you can work out questions like Sierra is noting that the idea that schools were not originally designed for healing, right? How do we then grapple and reconcile with that? Or Judy's question around how do I sit in patience and nurturing and being willing to listen? What happens when I'm not? How does that impact? So please join us next week for sure for our coaching clinics so that um, we, can, we can make meaning of meaning making. <laughs> I also, we wanna offer you, you know us, hopefully you know us by now that we're gonna offer you a lot of reflection questions. And so these are questions to sit with, to journal with, to bring into your staff meeting conversations, as long as there are the norms and working agreements to do so, of what is what would it look like to create and hold a culture and a climate after an event or ongoing experiences? And 
how might we bridge both our personal and our professional stories to support ourselves? It's something that definitely has come up if we ourselves are part of the community and we're experiencing the crisis and having to lead through the crisis. How do we do that double, double crisis consciousness work? Right? And how do we blur the lines? How do we hold when our, our lines are blurred? As we talked about last week, when our, we're not actually leaving our person at the door, we bring our person in the door because that's how we renew. But what does that mean for us and our own boundaries? And then the biggest question is, what does healing mean to you? How have you learned how to heal from those who came before you? How have you learned how to heal from those you serve? I know I learned a lot more from my students than I knew from the books. <laughs> What does healing not look like to you? Oftentimes that's actually more helpful is sometimes to think about what it isn't versus what it is. And knowing that it is an ongoing dynamic experience. So healing for me last year might've looked really different than healing for me in this moment because I'm responding to different contexts and ecosystems and a different Leora than Leora past. So questions to sit with and to marinate in, to stew in. And I'm going to offer you, as we always do together, as we close, I'm going to offer you um, to put in a takeaway, an idea, or a quote. You saw me writing down quotes in the chat box that I was getting from Savannah and Aaron and Coriander and Oriana. You want to put in a takeaway, idea, or quote, or some of you have already put in your wonderings or questions, and you're also invited to put in an appreciation. So you have total choice of how you yourself would like to exit ticket out of our learning together can be a takeaway, can be a question or a wondering, or can be an appreciation. Maybe some of you heard, oh, I am doing that. So like, I'm, I'm actually doing the renewal work right now. Like I know how to do that. <laughs> so I'm gonna invite, I'm gonna wait until I see some of them. I'm gonna invite Aaron and Savannah, Oriana and Coriana to also contribute to the chat box, your own takeaways, your own questions, your own appreciations so that we can be in learning together. All right, let's see a couple that are coming. Okay, so I'm actually just gonna take this time as folks are, um, are inputting. I'm gonna read out Sierra's beautiful line, schools are cornerstones and safety nets for our communities and shifting to a healing centered focus has to be a priority. Coriander mm -hmm. is offering every relationship is significant and important, build them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, Kate is saying, I always feel reassured and challenged in these sessions. <laughs> nice work, webinar wizard. <laughs> uh, that is gonna be a new title that I'm gonna put on our resume. Thank you, Kate. Um, I think that is a nice, a, a lovely reminder of the values that we hold at SERR to both reassure you and affirm you and also challenge you because that, that is how we get assurance and challenge ourselves. There's a invitation, a recognition to take time for personal renewal as I head out for vacation tomorrow, the need to recenter, lovely. All right, so we've got a takeaway, heart space at the center of the school, a wondering, how can school leaders support each other through these processes at different sites? Thank you, Savannah, acknowledging many of you are at, DO, at, at um, state departments, district and county, so you're serving multiple sites. And of course, appreciation to Oriana for curating this space. Yes, curious for more resources on structural witnessing from Kate. So I think that that is a lovely, 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 um, lovely opportunity for us to program. Uh, and Kate, we will get on that. So Livia is our program manager and I think we will 100% acknowledge that. Um, I'm going to, oh, we're getting more and more, okay. Um, yes, agree with Savannah. So co-signing, making heart space the center of schools and then gratitude for those in the muck and transformation. Thank you panelists and Oriana for the self-holding. Yes, agree with Kate. Okay, lovely, keep them coming. We're transitioning and closing. So I wanna just, I wanna elevate Kate. You asked for specific practices on structural witnessing. So here you are. Uh, Livy, I'm gonna invite you to put into the chat box the bit.ly, but coming your way and all of our ways on uh, January 7th from 9.30 to 12.30. So that specific time, you can do the increments in one, two, three hours at your own, <laughs> your own mathematical ability. Uh, but in, in Pacific time, we're having this incredible event that Oriana is curating with our partners at Trauma Transformed and with many brilliant educators called Strategies for Mending Our Wounds, Recovering from School Crisis Through Art and Ritual. 
Uh, rumor has it that Savannah also uh, contributed to some ideation around the title. So we'll, um, we wanna just offer you, it's for educators by educators. There's four workshops, art-based therapeutics, movement strategy, restorative justice circle practices, uh, and collective storytelling. And they are all taught by brilliant educators. And the whole purpose is actually not to teach not to teach you to do something for someone, but to provide you the support to resource yourself. So uh, we'll come together, we'll get some grounding and settling from Lumos Transforms, and then you'll get to break out into workshops. We've got three CU hours available to participants uh, and it's completely free. So please, please, please spread the good word and join us on the 7th. All the workshops will be recorded so you'll get to learn and listen in. Um, and we're so grateful. And I want to just name that again, like I said, la next week, the last, uh, the last session in this module led by Trauma Transformed is our coaching clinic. So come with your thoughts and your questions and your wonderings and we'll sit in the muck together. I'm going to try and say muck as articulately as possible so it doesn't get misinterpreted for anything else. We'll sit in the sticky stuff together on the 17th. And then January, we have our last sessions, one focusing on, again, um, leadership in a, in, a, um, in a big way, merging recovery and renewal together. So you're gonna continue to see this pattern coming up. And then Trauma Transformed is gonna be holding a session on psychosocial supports for parents and caregivers during pandemic response. So definitely not to miss. And then we'll close out at the end of January all together. Uh, last but not least, of course, as you know, please let us know if you've got any technical assistance requests, resources, thought partnership you'd like. We've got a lot of programming coming up. Kate, I think um, there's been some folks who've mentioned in the chat box, what does it look like to recover and renew at the same time? So stay tuned for our coaching and our renewal consulting communities coming your way in February. And last but not least, I'm just going to actually go straight to our contact information and invite Livia to put the evaluation link in the chat box. Please do take five minutes to fill out an evaluation. It's how we can learn from you about what programs we want moving forward. Again, like I said, we're in our fifth month of five years, so we're learning with you so we can learn for you. Um, and last but not least, I want to say again, on behalf of the School Crisis Recovery and Renewal team, we're so grateful for all of you who show up to be reassured and to be challenged to lead in this moment. And thank you to Savannah, Coriander, Oriana, and Erin for being uh, courageous in your leadership and in your vulnerability and modeling what it looks like to sit in curiosity in this work. On that note, wishing you the rest of your day feeling again reassured and challenged together. Do fill out the evaluation form and we'll see you soon. Thank you.